Hello again. I'm Professor Tim Spector of the Zoe COVID study. And now that the study's been running for over two years, we're delighted to see how many of you continue to log every day and the incredible insights your reports give us. This allows us to track COVID infection symptoms throughout the nation. I'm going to be sharing how these symptoms have changed over time since we first started tracking them. Obviously, we're disappointed that COVID continues to rampage through the world and we are seeing daily case rates continue to show record highs. And as we prepare for the lack of free testing in the UK, I'm going to share with you some promising results we've had on lateral flow tests and how we shouldn't be too upset about losing those uh, PCRs. And finally, I'm going to be showing you some interesting research from new health profiles in the app about your gut diseases. And you've got a hell of a lot of them, including an association between how many plants you eat and the, these gut and digestive issues. But first, let's have a, a quick look at this week's data. And as you can see, although cases have hit record highs over the last week, uh, there are signs that these daily case numbers are slowing and have stopped increasing for the moment. But the latest rates we had are 349,000, which um, is amazingly high. And it is a 7% increase on last week. Uh, but clearly, this is a lower increase than we've seen before. But this means that there's many people now with COVID. We're talking one in 15. That's the highest prevalence rate we've seen. This seems to be generally now highest in London and Southwest England. And obviously, this has implications when you get on a bus or a train. Someone in that vicinity is likely uh, to be infected if they haven't been self-isolated. So um, deaths and hospitalizations, we're keeping an eye on it. I'm not giving you the details because there have just been slight minor increases in deaths, hospitalization and people on ventilators. Nothing major, but uh, uh, still no cause for complacency. In the age groups, cases have finally stopped increasing in most age groups. And you can see they're tailing off on this graph here. And particularly the, the first that go into these waves always tend to be the kids. Uh, and they're coming down now. And you can see the older ones, the reds and the purples, uh, the over 75s, are starting to peak. Uh, so hopefully they will start to drop a bit. But they are at three times le levels we've uh, seen in the older groups than we've ever seen this year. Uh, in the regions, again, it's pretty universal what's going on here. No real differences. Uh, all showing signs of slowing down. And Scotland, which came into this last uh, wave first, uh, is, has already plateaued, and hopefully we'll see some decreases there soon. Now, the symptoms. It's been nearly two years since we've observed that COVID is more than just a cough, loss of smell and fever. And we thought you'd like to see a little graph that shows the most common symptoms uh, and how they've changed over time. And we're taking this back to when we got this, the same questions on everybody, which was uh, June of uh, last year. And you can see here the, the red line, which is uh, the runny nose. And you can see how that was, was high, but it's, it's actually gone up 10% to be the predominant symptom uh, since we started. And you can see how uh, sore throat has uh, gone between 50 and 60%, but is now up to 70%. And we can also now see how uh, loss of smell has really plummeted. Uh, it was uh, up at 50% at one time, and now only just over 10%. And obviously fever, which uh, was a prominent symptom, is now only seen about a third of people. So that gives you a sort of idea of how things are changing and why your data is really so valuable because no one else is collecting this kind of data. No one else is going to pick up these new variants when we see them. So uh, just note again very quickly the commonest symptoms. Again, it's runny nose. And if you might remember, headache was our most prominent symptom um, about a year ago, and it's uh, well further down the list there. So runny nose, fatigue, sore throat, and headache are the ones to watch at the moment. 
Now, let's talk about those lateral flow tests. We were getting them from free, and it should be said that not every, most countries were not getting them for free at any time. So we were uh, in, a, in a slightly lucky scenario uh, compared to other people and did give many people a feeling of independence. But they're being stopped uh, really from uh, today. And the costs are going to have to be borne by the public and they are getting cheaper. And so if you don't need them every day, you really need one or two boxes a year uh, for when you do get symptoms and you want to use that to influence whether uh, you stay at home or not, uh, if it's not absolutely clear. At the moment, um, it's pretty clear that if you've got cold-like symptoms, even if your tests are negative, you've probably got uh, COVID. Now, we've been looking at how good these are because there's been a lot of controversy about how um, well do these tests perform? Are they really good or not? And actually, uh, we looked at about nearly 100,000 of your results on the app of people who tested with a lateral flow test on the, exactly the same day as they got their PCR result. And so the day was exactly the same. And that allowed us to see if we're calling the PCR result the gold standard, which it isn't, of course, uh, it gets it wrong as well. But if there's, it's hard to do otherwise, we're able to get what's called sensitivity and specificity for the results. And that really means it, it's accuracy. So you can see here that uh, whether it's for Delta or for Omicron, sensitivity is 85 to 76, so 79%. So pretty high levels. That means that uh, in, in for Delta, 85% of uh, the swabs were uh, picking up real disease. The number of false negatives was about 15%. And Omicron, it's now about 20%. So one in five currently uh, testing negative are actually positive. And that's slightly changed with these, these viruses. Now, specificity, which is the actually false negative, is, is the false positive, is actually really low for both. So for Delta, it was around 4%. That's 4 in 100. And Omicron, um, about 3 in 100. So very similar for those. So it's highly unlikely that if you've got a, a positive, you're not going to... If a positive test, it's very likely it's real and only a small chance that it's a false one. And it's interesting to look at the differences between Delta and Omicron. It could be the virus loads are different, and that's why it's slightly less sensitive now. We're getting less virus in your nose, or it could be the effect of people having more vaccine. Uh, it's hard to tell. But I think it's really reassuring that these are pretty accurate. And so if you can afford to uh, buy some of these boxes, uh, it's still really worth you doing it and shows you don't really need those expensive uh, PCR tests that uh, take up a lot of time to perform and get your, your result back. So that's a, an example of really one of the great technologies that have been developed so fast during this crisis. Now we're going to switch tax and look at your uh, gut health from the questions you've been filling in on the health profile. And an amazing 27% of you recorded some current gut disease. And out of this, irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, was the commonest at around 39%. So uh, this shows how common these, these gut problems are. And the second commonest was uh, reflux. Now, having some gut disease is, of, is associated in the data we saw with increasing body mass index, um, the uh, fat to muscle ratio, uh, and also goes up with age generally. And women also uh, seem to be suffering more from gut complaints than men. Interestingly, something we haven't picked up before is that if you have a mild mental health condition, such as uh, depression, anxiety, uh, you're also more likely to have a higher rate of gut disease. And that really emphasizes this link between the brain and the gut probably due to these uh, gut microbes I keep going on about. Now, um, we went deeper, deeper into the data to see uh, 
how diet affects uh, gut disease. And because you, most of you have now uh, filled out a diet uh, assessment a couple of years ago, and we found that those of you that uh, at that point were having a very high plant consumption, lots of plants in your diet, which we consider really healthy, that was associated with a lower rate of any gut disease. Now, there are some limitations to that data because it's, it's not necessarily causal, but I think it, it points us in the right direction because we also saw no difference between uh, whether you smoked or not, uh, whether you uh, had uh, lots of sleep or not, and other ways of quantifying your, your diet and whether uh, probiotics prevented it or not. So I think this, these other negative results suggests that the uh, plant, plant consumption is really important long-term for your gut health, and we'll be doing more work to try and uh, tease this out. Now, gut disease incorporates many different sub-areas, and you might be interested to see the next graph, which looks at the risk of having a gut disease, of a particular gut disease, if you have a high plant consumption. And interestingly, uh, when, when these bars, these lines cross this one, it means it's not significant. But all the uh, these little circles that are to the left of this one line mean that it's protective, means that for this particular problem, eating plants is, a, is generally a good thing. And so the strongest associations we have are here with Crohn's disease, um, celiac disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, diverticulosis, uh, ulcers, gallstones, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, reflux, and hernias. Now, some of these might be confounded by the fact that some people change their diet when they get these diseases, and we're going to look more into that. But this is really just a... An, giving you some feedback on how quickly we can use this data if uh, you continue to collect it for us. So it'd be an interesting experiment on the app. Could we put people with irritable bowel syndrome or an inflammatory bowel disease on a plant-based diet for three months and uh, get them to monitor their symptoms? These are very th things we could do uh, as a citizen science project and we rely on you to give us your comments uh, below. So in conclusion, uh, we're really excited about the future of the study, not just uh, tracking COVID, although it's incredibly high at the moment, uh, but all these other diseases that we suffer from with continued uh, funding, luckily from the personalised nutrition company, Zoe. Now, rates have stopped going up, but COVID affecting one in 15 people at the moment, so do make sure you test and report in the app if you have symptoms, and of course, avoid people who have cold-like symptoms the last five days. Now, modeling that I've seen uh, from my colleagues at UCL suggests that rates are gonna go down a bit, and then they're not gonna disappear. They're gonna go maybe to half the rate we are now, and then bounce back in a sort of yo-yo effect. So. This is what's called a high prevalence uh, endemic state. And so it's never going to go perhaps below one in 50 people. So we need to be getting used to living with this for the next year at least. And it doesn't mean doing nothing about it. It still means protection and tracking are still key and looking after your own personal safety. And we'll hope uh, that the information we're giving you will enable you to do that uh, to the level that you want. It's all about giving people uh, information in this vacuum uh, that we have uh, this lack of information from HSA UK. Now, I want to thank everyone for the support of the app and for writing all those emails to the government. And we've been told that um, UK HSA and Jenny Harry's office will be doing a reply to you all. And uh, she and the rest of the department are well aware of the impact of the Zoe COVID study app. So finally, uh, do remember to like and subscribe to our channel. Do share the app uh, with anyone who's dropped off. Keep an eye on our website and app for updates. 
And finally, support science and keep logging. <laughs>